Here's a joke my grandpa would have loved. What do you call a murderer with moral fiber? That's right, a serial killer. <laughs> Sorry, I should have warned you. Now, I'm not proud to admit this, but there's a part of me that actually really loves this joke too. And I love it because it's so weird and so quintessentially human. It's one of the last things we'd expect a computer to understand. And yet, this joke was written by a computer. That's right, I'm talking about computational humor. That's using computers to generate and understand humor. It's an actual field, no joke. <laughs> Sorry. So computers today, see, they're getting smarter. They're getting smarter, but they're also developing a sense of humor. And as these algorithms of humor, so to speak, as they continue to develop, they have the potential to change how we relate to our mechanical friends, but also how we relate to each other. And to be clear, I don't think this is just a curiosity. As computers increasingly surround us in our lives, I think it's going to be a necessity. Now, I wasn't always convinced of the value of relatable machines, let alone uh, making you laugh with software. I mean, why would I need my software to lighten the mood, right? But then I took a closer look at myself. See, I'm not an angry man, but I routinely fantasize about taking my laptop and smashing it against a rock. And it's always for the stupidest reasons, like maybe the internet's a little slow. It's not even the laptop's fault. No, people, people frustrate me too. But the difference is that with people, I have a safety valve called humor. Even on a call with Comcast, someone cracks a joke, it changes the whole dynamic. And this is because humor has a way of instantly connecting us with each other, even complete strangers. You're more than 30 times as likely to laugh when you have company than when you're by yourself. More broadly, we can look at humor as sort of the WD-40 of human interactions. In a world where we're increasingly surrounded by computers, we're going to desperately need some of that lubrication, or we're going to drown in the frustration. Now, it's really important to recognize the significance of this problem. Like, computers today aren't just word processors. They're on our wrists, they're in our toasters, they're inside our medical devices. They're are becoming our, our assistants, our companions, even our caretakers. And it's not just the movie Her that I'm talking about here. I mean, Watson, Siri, Cortana, Google, now these, these machines interact with people every day. And we're starting to see that humor can be helpful. Siri, for instance, often has to deal with some pretty boneheaded questions, uh, like this one. Uh, Siri, what color are your eyes? Um, and Siri says in response, I don't have eyes, but if I did, I think I'd be rolling them a lot. <laughs> okay, that's great. But, now, even though this is clearly a canned joke, I do think it hints at the ways that humor can reduce some of the friction between us and our machines, especially as they surround us. But this is where computational humor gets really interesting. It's not just about connecting us with our machines. It can also help connect us with each other, especially for those of us who have trouble in social situations. Now, in many ways, I, I experienced this firsthand. See, I wanted to be a comedian when I was a kid. And there was a reason for that. See, I, I was an only child, my parents moved around a lot, and the only constant friends I had really were in my computers or in the shows that I watched, but that's not really a substitute for human connection. So at every new school and every new town, I sort of found myself back in the same place, trying to make friends with strangers. And for someone who's shy or socially awkward, that's terrifying. So I decided I was going to connect with people by making them laugh. Now, this might sound like a fairy tale, but unfortunately, comedy is really hard, <laughs> and I was really bad at it. <laughs> so I took what could very generously be described as an algorithmic approach to humor, <laughs> okay? So I'd start with a joke like this one. What do you call a bee that eats too much? Uh, chubby, okay? I was in elementary school, cut me some slack. <laughs> now, I'd recognize, not being a total moron, that the, that the humor in this joke comes from the similarity of chubby and bee. And then I'd replicate this tons of times. What do you call a bee that's good for your health? A vitamin bee. What do you call uh, a newborn bee? A baby. What do you call a bee in the spring? A maybe. You get the idea. Now, <laughs> you, you can keep going with this. <laughs> now, what's, what's interesting is, I mean, sometimes even this would be too much effort, and I just uh, copy the original joke outright. You can probably see why I became an engineer. Now, <laughs> now what's, uh, 
What's interesting, though, is that this, this process that I described for you, this very hackish and uncreative process, it may not sound like an algorithm, but it is. In fact, at the same time that I was pulling this Carlos Mencia Act in the early 90s, Kim Binstead, uh, Graham Ritchie, and a bunch of other researchers were busy jump-starting the field of computational humor using what was essentially very sophisticated ideas using the same fundamental ideas that I was using, right? and these stupid little examples that I shared with you. Let me show you a simplified view of their process. What do you call it when dinosaurs collide? Tyrannosaurus rex. OK, that's our pun. <laughs> you can laugh. Um, there's four words here. Dinosaurs collide, Tyrannosaurus rex. Those are our key words. And they relate to each other in very specific ways, both in terms of how they sound, some of them sound alike, and in terms of what they mean. Some of them mean similar things. So we can ask a computer to go hunt through dictionaries and corpora for other combinations of words and phrases that have a similar pattern of relationships. Right? And what comes back, it's usually pretty awful. But every once in a while, we get something that my grandpa would approve of. Um, for instance, this one. What do you call a material with a bright side, a silver linen? So again, you see there's four words here, and they relate to each other in a very similar way as the previous example. So this is a lot of fun. But it's also more than that. Just as in my example, this too can help connect people with each other. In the mid-2000s, a group of researchers from Aberdeen, Edinburgh, and Dundee created a version of the system called Stand Up. And it, the goal of the system was to help kids who have communication dis disabilities of some sort. Now, a lot of what we call humor, we, we acquire through interacting with each other and participating in wordplay, and sadly, some kids don't have very many opportunities for that. And that's where this software comes in. It gives them sort of a playground where they can play around with puns, generating puns, and modifying the generation of puns as well. Uh, you can actually play with it, a version of it yourself. It's called the, the Joking Computer. Now, it's admittedly a, a focused example, but I think there's something more profound happening here. It's not unusual for those of us who have trouble interacting with each other to go to computers as sort of a safe place, as a safe haven. And there's something really powerful about taking that same space and using it to teach us how to laugh and how to make other people laugh. I find that really beautiful. But to use this more generally and broadly, we're going to have to go beyond puns to the more unstructured and, and subtle humor that we humans engage in uh, pretty regularly. I mean, think about the last thing that made you laugh. Chances are, not only was it not a pun, it probably wasn't even a joke. In some sense, the real goal for us here, it's not necessarily to create machines that are going to write jokes for us, but to create machines with personalities that we find humorous or amusing. Now, to get to personalities, though, we often have to go through language. And language is a bear. Your average English speaker knows tens of thousands of words and breaks grammatical rules about as often as he follows them. And even if you can get past that, there's issues of ambiguity, context, and, and general common sense knowledge. When I ask you, how much does President Obama make? Somehow you know I'm asking about his salary, not about how much soup he makes. This is very hard to encode into an algorithm. But in recent days, we may have caught a break. We may have found a back door. And this back door has a big sign on it, that's a hint, and the sign reads, data. The amount of data, specifically human-generated data, that's available to us today is unprecedented, and it's growing. And the reason it's so valuable, one of the many reasons, I should say, is that with it, we can teach our machines how to communicate with us. You've actually experienced this yourself if you've used an internet search engine in recent days, like Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, what have you. These machines have been trained by data how to understand your queries and your questions. But data could also go a step further and teach machines how to have amusing personalities. My favorite example of this actually happened earlier this year. And interestingly, I don't think it's typically seen as an example of computational humor, but it is. So several months ago, a graduate student at Stanford named Andre Karpathy introduced a piece of software called CharRNN. Now, what this software does, um, like some other pieces of software and algorithms out there, is it, is it trains machines to imitate a data set of your choice. So for instance, I compiled a very large list of tweets from believers. These are fans of Justin Bieber. And I fed it to this machine. This machine digested all these examples and gave me back a trained machine that could generate fake believer tweets. Basically, <laughs> yeah, basically imitating the style of this data set. Right? So when I asked this machine to talk, here's the kinds of things it says. I love the way he is so beautiful, baby. And hashtag MTV hottest, I love you so much, crying emoji, okay? So, <laughs> so I'm not an expert on believers, but uh, 
To my untrained eye, this seems like a pretty good imitation of the real thing, <laughs> right? Now, what's interesting is in recent days, people have been trying this with all sorts of data. Uh, political speeches, uh, the Bible, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey is actually one of my favorite examples. <laughs> I would apologize for all the whiteout, but honestly, you're not missing much, right? <laughs> Now, the, point I'm, the reason I'm showing you all these examples is I want you to notice something. In none of these examples is the machine cracking a joke. It's not running a stand-up routine. It's just the humor is a lot more subtle than that. It's buried inside the style of language. You could say that we've painted this machine's personality with data. And I think that's a step in the right direction. But it's also just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many ways in which computational humor can take advantage of data today. Researchers have built irony detectors, uh, insult generators, even, uh, even, there's, even a, there's even a double entendre recognizer out there called Deviant. It's actually the acronym for the algorithm. Now, we're also just really at the very beginning with these algorithms. There's so much about humor that they're not even remotely capturing yet. To take things forward, the timing couldn't be better. And on one hand, we have this incredible tool called data that's getting more powerful by the day. And on the other hand, our computers are surrounding us more and more every day, and, and the need for them to be more personable and relatable, that's just going to get stronger. I think computational humor could be the key to making healthy relationships between us and our machines, and also less frustrating lives for us. And in the process, it might even connect a few of us. Some may disagree. To quote Ann Wilson Schaaf, I recognize that humor isn't for everyone. It's only for those of us who want to have fun, enjoy life, and feel alive. <laughs> and here's to the algorithms that are helping us get there. Thank you.